Tony came home from work. At that time, he was working with Irvin and Johnson, and they had offered him promotion to take over the Kariba operations. So it wasn't very long after when we'd had to uh, uh, make uh, proper arrangements and we had to, as a family, move completely up to Kariba. But equally, once we got there, um, the whole sort of atmosphere, the whole way of life, um, I can still smell the sort of Kariba air. It was sort of with uh, fish, like a fishy smell with potatoes and things like, especially in the evening, in the dusk around about five, you'd get the aroma of the bush felt. It just conveyed peace and supper time was on and I cooked all the meals and, you know, we all ate and we spent most of our time perhaps on the verandas and um, we were on the side of the hill uh, it was very spacious, uh, there were plenty of glass, so plenty of light came into the home. Curtains with sailing ships and printing and that in the home. Our lounge suite at the time was cream, like an off-white, with the colours, because I've always loved colours, so the home really was very attractive as well. And the other thing we used to have were the baboons. You couldn't leave any washing on the line or anything because the baboons would be coming in and cart them off. And uh, another thing uh, that happened was any food. They would just take over and come and help themselves to food. So you had to make quite sure before you left the house that the, the house was closed so that they couldn't do that. But, uh, and I can also remember a pride of lines coming through Kariba Township uh, on the one occasion, yeah, and of course everybody <laughs> sort of pricked up lines, boy. <laughs> and uh, no, the it was nice, it, you know, but, but uh, you had to be vigilant. And snakes, of course, were plentiful, so again you had to be very vigilant uh, with snakes because they would come uh, creeping in on the verandas. The verandas in the homes in Kariba were very big and uh, but I think that's partly to do with the uh, the heat. And not only that, I think also wanting to catch the breeze because the temperatures could be anything up to 40, 42, 43, 44 Celsius. And it's those times, in fact, where the kids mostly were in the swimming pool. Uh, very often I would sit um, down at the harbour with the fishing nets and catch some fish, uh, you know, at the harbour. It was lovely, it was very peaceful. And um, we had very little to do, really. The children were able to go to school. And uh, when they came from school, they, they all headed for the swimming pool. And uh, all the children were able and learned to swim uh, there. Uh, you were out in the open. There was no red tape. There was no telephones, really, or there was no television. Um, you had to find your own entertainment, and that's where we came in. And I can still see Dad blowing his trumpet about nine or ten o'clock at night, <laughs> never worried about the neighbours. But it would echo as well right through the uh, the harbour, you know, with the hills and that, yes, it was lovely. And we'd probably also have our own sing-songs in the house. Uh, and wherever we went, whether it was the hotels, so I would always play the piano. Uh, on the one occasion, uh, I had Bradley with me and um, sat him on my lap, but if I was playing for the people, you know. And when it came to, uh, like, the Saturday night um, uh, braai and things like that, well, we were the life of the party. We were the band and... Uh, you know, we used to play and all of us and Dad would bring out his trumpet and he'd play the trumpet. So the the actual band consisted of the family. Uh, we had a chap there that had the old soap boxes with a stick in it to go boom, 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 boom. And he would be singing all the old croon songs and it was dancing. It was very, very, it was really enjoyable. And that happened every Saturday. It was just standard. And then on a Sunday, they used to have a movie. They had an outdoor-like theatre 
with a screen up and we could all go and sit. It was on the ground. It's uh, like just on steps and that you sat and you could watch a movie and that so it was no charge. It was just part of the entertainment while you were in Kariba. And, um, you know, so it, the whole life, the, um, the atmosphere was very friendly. We were all buddies, really. I mean, people from all over came to Kariba. And uh, not that we had much to do with them. I mean, we were actually just with the community. It was a very friendly and quite big community. I should think there must have been about estimated between four, five hundred people. I would think that's the white community and uh, the workers that uh, were there as well. Maybe not even as many as that, but uh, I mean, when it came to Saturday night uh, dance and bra, I mean, they all turned up. <laughs> And we didn't leave until about maybe 12, 1 o'clock in the morning, you know, before we all decided to go home. <laughs> and Dad would bring out his trumpet and he'd blow away. And it was a big family affair. And everybody knew everybody. And uh, everybody seemed to work together. When Dad was in Kariba, they also promoted him um, after about six months to take over the full operation of the Kariba fishing. Yes, I think they as good as doubled his salary almost, maybe more. But the responsibilities also went with it. And also they had the return on the fish because he was the only one that was able to bring home <laughs> plenty of fish. <laughs> and uh, Dad had a special boat uh, just for himself to check on the, the workers and the fishing. So he would sort of take himself down to Boomi and probably further up the lake. He also met the Patonga tribe uh, while he was there. It really hadn't met many of the Europeans or any of us, you know. Uh, but he would circle to make sure that uh, things were correct for the fishing. And uh, sometimes he would take us or take some of the children with him for the run. When it came to being in charge of the fishing section at Kariba, uh, he was very friendly with the scientists and they said to him, well, uh, they recommended you put your nets here and you put your nets there and covered like a lot of the background work. And sure enough, Dad put his fish uh, nets there and plentiful, the fish came home. <laughs> and uh, then, of course, he, he covered the, the gutting of it, the freezing of it, extracting the oil from the fish the carpenter for the drying of the fish, for the smoking of the fish. He actually covered every section himself. Uh, and uh, yes, he had like people, different sections uh, in charge, you know. And he also, the very first person to have the fish blast freeze. So as soon as they had gutted the fish and it was ready to go in boxes, he would put it in the blast freezer first. And that would freeze it, I think, within 20 minutes, half an hour, and then they would pack it to go into uh, Salisbury to their b very big cold rooms, which again, Dad uh, instituted the whole lot. Uh, with all the fish coming in, it must have been very attractive to the directors of the company. And of course, they got, uh, they sold the company um, and, um, you know, must have got really uh, very good money. Uh, and then the people taking over now um, they selected a chap to take over the management of Kariba and Dad had to revert back to Irvin and Johnson in Salisbury. And uh, when he left, they said, well, you've left now. You can tell us how you did it. <laughs> but forget it. <laughs> he never spilt the beans, he wouldn't tell them. But it was very simple. He studied the life of the fish with the scientists. And where they said you put your net, that's where he put his net in. Home came the fish. 